we're running. Cool, hope everybody's doing well. Uh, let's start with questions. Questions on uh, dynamic programming in general or um, questions on PA5. So um, I'll post some information on Zoom this afternoon. I'll send out an announcement um, with uh, on Canvas with information for the Zoom uh, presentation on Monday. So um, remember, Monday, um, 11 o'clock, is your SLP presentation. Um, and basically, instead of coming into the regular classroom here, you'll be going into a different Zoom room. And I'll post the information for that in Canvas later today. Um, once you're in that room, I will put you into a breakout room, and it will be approximately four people per room, and you'll basically just do your presentations. Um, and I'm going to suggest doing these round robin style, so you'll basically take turns um, one by one doing your presentation. Um, typically, you know, five minutes, maybe up to ten minutes for a presentation, so you'll probably end up presenting twice. And, you know, you can think of yourself as presenting to the other people in the room, but I'll be popping in and out of rooms. Izad will be popping in and out. And whoever else um, wants to come all over to Clark's, you know, expo and see what students are doing will pop from room to room, listen to presentations, maybe ask questions, things like that. Um, it's, it's pretty informal, right, because it's online. And it's also a little experimental because we haven't done this before. Um, SLPs have always been in person and, um, you know, last year when, when we locked down, um, we started, um, doing video presentation synopses. Um, so this is the first time we're trying to have people do live presentations in an online forum. Um, so we'll see how it goes. Um, we're prepared for hiccups, hopefully, but, um, I'll post the Zoom info today in a Canvas announcement, and then Monday, instead of coming into the regular classroom, you'll go to that Zoom room, and I'll, um, I'll be there, and I'll put you into breakout rooms, and we'll go from there. Um, there will be another presentation at the end of spring, which I believe will also be online. I don't think there's any plans for that to happen in person, unless something drastically changes um, COVID-wise. So that will, um, but there will be some kind of presentation, um, which will be, you know, kind of the final presentation for these projects. And that one tends to be um, more interesting to the public in general. So sometimes we get people from industry popping in, sometimes people from the press will pop in, things like that. And so that one, you know, hopefully people have something closer to a finished uh, project that they can uh, show and talk about. And that tends to be a lot of fun. The Dean of STEM is going to be out of town on travel on Monday, unfortunately, so she won't be able to come by. Um, but in the past, the Dean has always come in and occasionally the president of the college pops by and uh, just kind of like sees what people are doing. So good chance for some, you know, visibility um, and a really good opportunity to practice, you know, talking about your work, um, presenting to a group, but in a pretty low key format, right? Because we're we're you know, in the comfort of our, our own environment. Um, in the past, there's, there's been uh, people who, you know, know about Clark um, and, you know, work in industry who have come by. Um, if you, any of you were on campus last year before um, everything went remote, um, the engineering uh, club on Fridays, occasionally we'd have people from industry come by um, and, and sit in and listen to student presentations in there. So um, people like that. Yeah, it's always possible the press can come by. I mean, and these, these are good opportunities, you know. Um, it's, it's all bonus, right? Um, maybe you're just talking to, you know, other people in, in the group 
um, or, you know, to me or something like that. But, you know, maybe, yeah, Elon Musk pops in like, hey, I'm kind of bored. I'm going to check out Clark College Expo and, and bang, you know, golden opportunity. So, um, so, so, yeah, try to have fun with it, right? It's, it's a, a, um, a new experience sometimes to talk about ourselves and talk about our work. And that can be, you know, something that we get nervous about. Um, but it's something that you'll, you'll probably be doing your whole careers. Um, and I know a lot of you, you know, are very enthusiastic about certain things, um, whether it's gaming or, you know, pet projects or programming or, or, you know, investing in, in, uh, the market or whatever. And, and if you can share that enthusiasm, if you can get that enthusiasm and excitement across to somebody, right, that's, that's almost always going to work in your favor, whether it's a job interview or, you know, pitching for a proposal that you want to get funded or, you know, whatever, um, talking to a venture capitalist, trying to get investors in your company. Um, so this is, this is all good practice. Um, and the, the logistics of the presentation can be pretty much what you want. So, um, you know, if you, if you made one of those posters for the final upload um, on Canvas, right, you can screen share and put that up on your screen and then talk, you know, while people look at your poster. Um, if you prefer to, to show code or if you have, you know, something physical, some kind of prototype you want to show and you want to put a camera on that, you can do that. Um, if you prefer to, you know, stand in front of a whiteboard and, and talk and have somebody look at you, you can put a camera on yourself. Um, it's totally up to you. Um, but it, it might be worth, you know, spending a few minutes ahead of time trying to figure out what you want to do. Right. And then, and then maybe, you know, practicing on, on your dog or cat or a pillow or something. And, and just, you know, so at the first time that you're saying these words of, you know, my name is such and such, and I'm working on this project, right. Um, have gone through that once or twice, just so that you don't, you know, feel totally like, oh my gosh, what am I going to say? You know, should I tell them my name? Should I tell them my first name or my whole name? Right. So just to sort of deal with, with any kind of nervousness or so on. Pretty low key, have fun. It's a good opportunity. And, you know, typically we like talking about ourselves and we like talking about things that we are interested in or that we care about or that we get excited about. And just, you know, be yourselves. All right, so any questions about that? All right, questions about PA5. So hopefully you've you've been playing with or thinking about your max val function and you have something um you know at least a, a boilerplate version of that. Um and the way we first described max valid returns an integer which is, you know, put in the capacity, get back the maximum value. Um, is there a larger database file we can test our code on? Yeah, just make one up. I don't, I don't have one. I just have that standard one. Um, but you can, you can just make up a file with some random numbers and uh, see if you can crash your program. So our max val function is, is, you know, this thing that takes an integer capacity and returns an integer, which is a maximum value. And again, you definitely want to get that working first. But once that's working, then you want to be able to report, you know, the maximum value is 15. And you get that by using one of item one and one of item three and none of item two. So you want to be able to report this inventory back. Um, and that's that's really a small addition, but you gotta you gotta dial it in just right. So my suggestion is, you know, max val right now it returns an integer. Let's make a new type of variable. Let's make like a, a super duper integer, um, and let's call this something like, you know, a structure answer.
and it might have you know an integer field for the maximum value which is what we would normally return from our integer version of maxval but then we also want to record in this answer this inventory well you can do that with a simple array of integers so we could say integer item count and there's a maximum of 128 items available so we can just make this an array of 128 And now when we define our maxval function, instead of returning an int, it returns a struct answer. So it still takes an integer capacity, but it returns this, this complex answer, this complex type of object, which has both an integer and an array of item counts. And so typically your max val loop is going to be something like this, you know, best equals zero for i equals zero to whatever, um, try equals value of i plus max val capacity minus weight of i. If try is bigger than best, then set best equal to try. And then at the end, you return best. We're not talking about the dynamic programming part yet. This is just uh, just thinking about um, the main loop, right? Where you've got three items. So take the value of the first plus max val capacity minus the weight of the first. Take value of the second plus max val capacity minus the weight of the second and so on. So this calculation trying to find the largest value that comes from that. So if we were just worrying about the value and not the inventory count, we could do something like this. Initialize, you know, your best number you've seen so far. Do your calculation for each one, right? With, you know, make sure this is a legal combination so the weight doesn't exceed the capacity. But, you know, see what this, this calculation gives you. If that gives you a better answer, record that as your best answer. So now if you move to trying to record the inventory so that your max val returns this, right, you simply make best a struct answer. So struct answer best and initialize max value in that to zero. And then try will be a struct answer. And so we would say if try max value is bigger than best max value, right? So the usual business of dealing with a structure in C. And if it is, then we save, you know, this, this max value that we just got. But then we need to save updated item count. And what do we do? Well, if this is the best value we've seen so far, then we would go ahead and we'd say, well, let me, let me do it on one. Let's say we're finding max val of four. All right, so um, we're gonna do three calculations. So I'm going to start off with, with um, you know, my best answer so far, which will be a zero. I'll do my calculation two plus max val three, I get 11. 11 is bigger than 0. So what am I going to do? I'm going to save my, my best answers max val to be 11. And I'm going to set the item counts to be 0, 1, 0. And then I'm going to increment the item count for item this first item because this is the first item I'm, I'm evaluating. So, so if try is bigger than best, I'm going to save the uh, max value from try into the max value for best. I'm going to copy the the item count from try to best and then I'm going to increment the count for item i. 
So after I do this first calculation, I would say my best inventory is one, one, zero. And then I'll do my next calculation. I'll see my max value is 11. That's not better. So I'm going to leave my best item count as one, one, zero. And then I'll do my third calculation. I'll see that that returns a value of 13. That's better. So I'll copy this into my best item count. I'll increment the third item to a one. And when I'm done, I'll simply return my best, which will return a value of 13 and an item count of 001, which is this information up here. So it's almost certainly simpler to code that than it is to try to understand what I just said, because this, this doesn't translate into words very nicely. Um, but, but the punchline is, right, figure out how to do this just returning integers, just to write a function that gives you the integer maximum value, and then change it so that instead of returning an integer, it returns a structure that includes the maximum value, but also the item count. And then inside your code where you recur, record the best solution you found so far, in addition to recording the best value, also record the inventory and just bump up the item count for whichever item that calculation corresponds to. There, I said it again. There's probably no clearer the second time. All right, so so any any lingering questions on, on knapsacks? In a pack, exactly. Uh, call the repo exactly what it's called in the assignment. It is a typo, but I decided um, the moment I discovered that that I was not going to change it because then we've got conflicting information depending on which version you look at. So uh, name it in a pack which is a typo, but call it exactly what's in the assignment. <coughs> and hey, if we invent one of these things, we could like trademark that name, the Knapak. All right, and again, this is due Tuesday morning. The grading rubric says it's due Monday. It's not, it's due Tuesday. So the due date on Canvas is correct. All right, good to go. So let's talk about longest common subsequences. So this is another um, recursive problem that lends itself really well to this kind of approach that we've been using for knapsack and for rod cutting yesterday. Um, and, and problems in this category have usually two things in common. One, you can express the solution to this problem in terms of solutions of smaller problems, right? So that's the, the recursive piece. And two, you tend to find the same subproblems popping up again and again. So repeated common subproblems. And that's where dynamic programming is going to come in because we're going to save the values the first time that we calculate them and then we won't have to recurse to calculate these values again. Um, and so solution in terms of subproblems and then uh, common repeated subproblems, those suggest uh, dynamic programming type solution. So let's look at this longest common subsequence. And the idea is, is the following. Suppose you have a, a pair of strings All right? So there's a string and we have another string
And these might be strands of base pairs of DNA. And in the process of sequencing DNA from an organism um, and splicing together the pieces, sometimes there are things missing in between. Sometimes there's extra stuff that gets mixed in. And so these could be strands of DNA from the same organism, even though they don't look like the same string. And if we compare them character for character, there's more spots where they disagree than they agree. But we would ask the question, is there some substring in here, which is also a substring in here? Well, yeah, obviously there's a bunch of them. There's a G, there's a G. There's an AT, there's an AT. So we can ask the question now, what's the longest substring that we can find in common between this and this? And we're not requiring these substrings to be consecutive characters. In other words, we're not requiring that ATT actually occurs down here, although it does. But we would accept ATT as matching this ATT. And so this is a, a classic problem. It pops up in bioinformatics, but also, you know, in, in trying to parse uh, human written text and things like that. Looking for patterns where, where one thing has a pattern that occurs in a second thing, but those patterns may not simply be the same thing character for character, right? Um, and so, so there's a number of ways we could, we could find substrings from here that are in here. There's a G, and there's a G, there's an A, there's a T, there's another A, there's a T, there's a T, and there's an A. So that's a substring of length 8 that's common between here and here. But there's other ways that we could, we could identify substrings, right? So, so I could start with my G, and... Um, and my A, and pick up this A, and this T, and this A, and this G, and this C, and this A, and this G, and this T, and this A, and there's a substring of length 11. A greedy algorithm doesn't work here. If you just start matching, you know, everything that you find in common, you may not find the longest common substring. So it's, it's a bit of an exhaustive search question. We need to consider every possible substring from here and see if it's a substring in there, and then among all those possibilities, find the longest substring. So how many substrings are there that are possible in a string of length n? Well, for each character, we can choose whether to include it or not include it in our substring. Right, so this is a two to the n proposition. So there's two to the n possible substrings of this, and for each of those, we could do an order n operation to see if it's a substring in here. Um, it's actually worse than order n, though. All right, so that's that's a horrible order of complexity. Um, so we'd like to find an efficient solution for this. And we can do it by breaking this LCS function into a recursive, um, a recursive definition. All right, so everybody understand the basic setup because it's, it's gonna get hairy quickly. You understand the goal we're after. Okay, good. So we're just trying to find, you know, if I if I don't require these characters to be consecutive and I need them to be in the same order, what's the longest string that I can pick out of here that I also find in here in the same order? All right, so here's a really kind of slick way. Of finding the longest common substring of two strings. And I'm going to, to introduce a piece of notation. Um, if S is a string, 
let s prime be s with the last character removed. So the main thing we're going to do with strings is we're going to pop off the last character. So if this string was s, this string would be s prime. If this is s, then this would be s prime. So I'm just going to use s prime as a symbol for the original string s with the last character removed. All right. So with that, we can write our, our function for LCS really, really simply. So there's two possibilities. If s1 and s2 have the same last character, so they both end with an A, here's what we can do. We can ignore that A. We can find the longest common substring in these two truncated strings and then just add an A to the end. Because any substring of this, if we add an A, it's a substring of the original string. And any substring of this, if we add an A to the end, it becomes a substring of this original string. So if there is a longest common substring between these two, we know it's going to end with an A, right? Because it's going to be a common substring between these truncated strings with an extra A at the end. So if S1 and S2 have the same last character, then we return 1 plus the longest common substring of S1 prime and S2 prime. All right, so that's just the observation that if these things both end with an A, the longest common substring of these truncated strings plus one more character, that's the longest common substring of these. The other possibility is these strings do not end with the same last character, so say there's an extra G at the end of this one. They don't have to be the same length strings, by the way. Let's say there's a G at the end of this string. Well, There's two possibilities here. So if I find the longest common substring between these two, it's possible that, that longest common string could end with an A. In which case, the longest common substring between these two is the same as the longest common substring between these two. Right? If the LCS of these ends with an A, then it's also going to be the LCS of these, because I know this last character is not an A. And if the LCS ends with an A, then it's not going to include this last character, so it'll be the same as the LCS of these. On the other hand, if the last character of the LCS is not an A, then the LCS of these is the same as the LCS of these. In other words, if the longest common substring doesn't end with an A, I can take an A off of this first string. It's not going to affect the longest common substring because it doesn't end with an A. So there's two possibilities here. So it could be either the largest common substring of... Um, S1, S2 prime, or the longest common substring of S1 prime, comma, S2. So the LCS of these strings will be either the LCS of S1 with truncated S2 or a truncated S1 with the original S2. We calculate both of these and we return the largest of them. All right, and we need a base case. So 
So our base case is if either string has length zero, return to zero. If either string has length zero, then the longest common substring between that and another string is going to be zero. Right, if S1 has length zero, there's no substring in S1. And with that base case in mind, you can see this recursion will eventually end. Every recursive call that we make to LCS reduces the length of one or both of our strings. If we're in case one, we'll call LCS with both strings truncated by one character. If we're in case two, we'll call with one of our strings truncated and then the other. And so each time that we make a recursive call, one of our arguments gets shorter in length. And if we do that enough times, eventually one of our arguments will have length zero and will return without doing any further recursion. This is not always guaranteed with any old piece of recursive code that you write. You've always got to look at your base case, look at your recursive calls, and ask yourself, are we guaranteed that eventually this recursion will end? And if you're not, then you might have code that runs forever until you run out of stack space. Right? But here, it's the depth of the recursion is bounded by the combined length of S1 and S2. All right, so there's a nice recursive way to solve the longest common substring problem. So here's, here's what this looks like in C. And, you know, again, C is not always the most friendly language for playing with strings. So most of the work in here is dealing with this business of, of um, you know, we want to be able to truncate a string by one character. And so rather than dealing with null terminators, I'm using a different kind of string in here. I'm just treating a string as an array of characters, but I'm pairing it with a length. So my LCS function takes actually four arguments. So it takes um, a pointer to the first set of characters and the number of characters in that first string, and then a pointer to the second set of characters and the number of characters in the second string. And this returns an int, which is the length of the longest common substring. All right, so, so I'm limiting my strength to 100 characters, just for convenience. I ask the user to enter two strings. I get those with f gets. I remove the new line from the end. Otherwise, that would be a common character, and it would just add one. And then I call LCS, and I pass it, you know, the two strings and their length using string length, and I just return uh, the length of the longest string, and I print that out. And the code is is pretty straightforward, right? So I'm passing in the length of both strings. So if either length is less than or equal to zero, then I just return zero. So that's our base case gets us out of the recursion. Otherwise, I'm going to print out for our entertainment which strings LCS was just called with. So I'll print out strings A and B. And these are not null terminated strings, so I'm using my own print function which is just a loop. And then here's the actual, the actual calculation of the LCS. So two cases. The first case, the two strings end with the same character. So the last character of A is equal to the last character of B. And in that case, I calculate the longest common subsequence of these truncated strings, and I truncate them just by saying that the length is one less than what it actually is. And then I add one to that longest common substring, and I return that. So that's this case right here. Right? One plus the longest common substring of the two truncated strings. That's exactly what this does. say minus the last character okay otherwise if the last character is different 
I need to calculate these two LCSs and return the larger of the two. So I make a pair of calls. The first one calls for the largest common substring of A and the truncated version of B. And the second one calls for the largest common substring of a truncated version of A and the original string B. And if return 1 is bigger, then I return return 1. Otherwise, I return return 2. So this is just an if statement that returns the largest of ret1 and ret2. And that's it. That's really, you know, three or four lines of code to do this, right? All right. And then my print function is is just a loop that just prints out character by character because again these strings aren't necessarily null terminated. When I pass, you know, a to it and I tell it its length is one less, I'm not going to find a null terminator at the end. So, so to print out one of these things, I tell it how long it is and I just print the characters for that string. Um, and this works. Um, so long as common substring has length three, I should have seen what I typed in in the beginning. So somewhere there's a common string of length three. Um, so I think I found it. So there's an H and there's a B and there's an E and there's an H and a B and an E. But you can see um, the recursive calls that are being made here, right? So, so the last character is different, and so it, it finds the longest common substring between this and I can't believe I'm trying to unwind this by hand. How far am I going to have to go? Oh man, I'm barely touching it. Um, I'm not going to find the end of that. Um, but it's it's going to find the the longest common substring between these and between this and hello bye, right? So all of this stuff is looking for the longest common substring of that first case. This is fun but weird and hello by, and that involves another recursive call, which is finding the longest common substring between this original and the truncated version of the second string. Right, which requires, you know, longest common substring between those and so on, right? And so you can uh, follow that through and then eventually it's going to, you know, start comparing the first two strings. All right, so what, what do we get from this? Um, this is foo, this is fun but, and h. We needed to find the LCS at that point. Down here, we again needed to find the LCS of this is fun but and H. And to do that requires all of these recursive calls. Well, we already did that work up here. So if we could cache our answer, if we could record what the longest common substring was between this and this, then the next time we needed to find that down here, we wouldn't have to do all of that recursion. Right? So this is that repeated substructure that suggests dynamic programming will help. So we would like to cache these values so that next time that we try to do one of these calculations, we don't go down the whole recursive tree. And you can see without caching, there's a lot of work going on here. And these are relatively short strings. Right, compared to, you know, a strand of DNA that had, you know, a few thousand base pairs, these are relatively modest, but it's a lot of work. All right, 
So if we want to actually record not just the length of the longest common substring, but actually the longest string itself, we again need to augment the return value from this function. Right now it returns an int. We need to do something so it returns not just an int, but also the common substring. And we can cheat and see and do that by just returning a string because the string also contains the length. But you know, PA5, make a structure. If we wanted to make a structure here, <coughs> we could make a structure that included the length and the characters of the common substring and then return those as part of this, this structure. Um, but basically, you know, in this case, whatever the longest common substring is of these, simply tack on the last character of S1 or S2, and that's the longest common substring of these. And in this case, the longest substring will be either the longest string we got from this or the longest string we got from that. So it's easy to calculate these. The trickier part is, you know, how do you pass these back? Um, but it's, it's not too bad. So I've changed LCS to return a car pointer which I will null terminate, despite the, the pain and agony of that. Um, and so this is the same, right? Um, but once I get back the longest common substring of these truncated strings, I go ahead and I store the last character of string A into the last character of this, and I pop on a null terminator. And then I return that string. And if, if the strings are different then the value I want to return is just the full common substring of either of these cases and so whichever one has the longer length I just return that string and so this works as well I misspelled weird but there's the longest common substring HBE All right, so dynamic programming, if we want to cache these values, remember the basic setup for dynamic programming is the following. So we're trying to find, you know, some function with some input value, and we do the hard work section and we eventually calculate what the output of this function should be and we say return out okay so this is without dynamic programming this is just kind of you know taking for example all of this and coding it up so our input is s1 s2 our output is a number the longest length or a substring um, collection of characters or something. But this is the general, you know, setup for any function, right? Have a declaration that takes some input, do some hard work, generate an answer, return the answer. So the dynamic programming part is, you know, we have a cache, we have an array or something that's saving our work. And um, if cache bracket in is valid, then we just return that. But if there's no entry for this, this input value in our cache, we do the hard work, we calculate the answer, but before we return it, we save it. We say cache in equals whatever this output's going to be. And so the second time that we try to calculate our function with the same input, we'll check our cache, we'll see that it's valid, we'll just read it out of memory and return it. And we skip the hard work. The nature of this cache, the nature of telling if it's valid, the nature of saving, and the nature of returning depends on the particular problem. So our first example was Fibonacci numbers, and for Fibonacci numbers, our input was an integer. It was, you know, some number bigger than or equal to 1. And our output is also going to be an integer, and it's going to be positive. So our cache was a simple integer array. 
and we initialized it to zeros and we said if the entry in here is zero it's not an actual valid entry in our cache but if we've saved a calculation of a Fibonacci number into our cache we know that this will be bigger than zero so when we look in our cache if we see a number bigger than zero we say oh that's valid and we just return it so that worked really simply right simple array of integers copy your your calculated Fibonacci number into the index given by your argument and then up here just see if the value in that save array was positive and if it is return it okay same thing works for max val for the knapsack problem ignoring the question of inventory counts right just to find the maximum value for a given capacity you can make an array maximum capacity is 1024 so make an array of of a thousand 25 um, elements so that we can access the 1024th right and we know that the max val will always be bigger than zero it could be zero but if it's zero and we recalculate it it's not a big problem so we could get away with a simple array of integers again and when we calculate the max val save it in our cache indexed by the capacity that we called max val with and in the beginning of max val see if your your uh, save array at that index is bigger than zero and if it is return it otherwise do your calculation but when you want to record the inventories as well the number of items that get you that max value now you got to move to something fancier you got to have an array of these struct answers or whatever in this case the problem gets even worse because our arguments to this function are not integers they're strings and so our cache would need to be something that we can index with a pair of strings. And then in that cache location, we would store the length of the longest common substring and the actual longest common substring itself. Let's see, you can answer them before for the inventory. Yes, exactly. Perfect. You got it. So for this problem, right, we probably need to deal with a hash because we can't just use an integer to index an array. We've got um, a pair of strings that need to be used. In other words, we need to know, hey, um, have I ever calculated LCS of, you know, the strings ABC and, you know, AEIOU? And so our cache needs to be able to take in a pair of strings and know if we've calculated the longest common substring, and if so, what was it? And so we'd probably use something like a hash table that we index off of, you know, this pair of strings. And so we run them through a hash function and, and collisions and probing and chaining and all of that fun stuff. Um, but you can do it, right? Um, we may do this in 223 when we have some, uh, some data structures at our disposal. All right. So that's, that's another example problem. Again, you know, I'm not going to ask you to code this for this course, but I want you to think about this as another, you know, example of a problem with common repeated uh, substructures and this, this recursive solution. Um, so tomorrow we will we'll, uh, talk about throwing eggs off a building and we'll, we'll look at the egg drop problem, which is, which is one more instance of this kind of thing that lends itself to dynamic programming. Um, all right, cool. Have a good afternoon. I will see you tomorrow.